everyone. Welcome back to day two of FairCon 2020. Thank you so much for joining us for the, our virtual event this year. We miss seeing everybody in person, but uh, we think that this virtual event is really fantastic. We had a great day one. I hope that you enjoyed all the sessions and the interactions that you were able to have with the different sponsors and with all of our speakers and panelists as well. If you haven't had the chance to visit our sponsor area yet and talk to the sponsors at their virtual booths, please do so today. They have great offerings, uh, all fair based for you uh, to help you and your organization adopt uh, fair and, and quantitative practices. Um, today, we have a really great lineup again of some wonderful sessions. Um, this keynote address that I'm gonna introduce here in a minute, we also have different vertical industry breakouts later this afternoon. So if you're interested in, in areas of technology, uh, financial services, government, and healthcare, uh, please join us this afternoon for some really get great use case uh, presentations uh, to hear about people who are actually uh, adopting FAIR and applying it at their organizations today. Um, and then we'll have our great closing keynote at the end of the day today, so stay tuned all the way through the end um, and feel free to interact with the speakers at each of the sessions. You can use the chat feature to ask questions and the speakers will be able to answer them in real time uh, through the platform while the session is going on. If you have any questions, please see our info desk at the, uh, in the lobby of the virtual event platform. So without further ado, we are going to kick off day two of FairCon 2020 with our keynote session today, how to help the business make the right decisions on risks they struggle to see. And moderating the Q&A today is Jack Jones. He's the chairman of the FAIR Institute and the author of the FAIR model. And with him is Michelle Walker, and she is the author of The Gray Rhino. So uh, tune in and uh, enjoy the session. And I will turn it over to you, Jack. Thank you, Luke, and welcome everyone, especially Michelle. I've been excited about this session since we first conceived it. So let's dive in then. I'm sure that many of the people watching this are already familiar with your work. But for those who aren't, maybe this is a good place for you to share a little bit about your background. So um, I come from a policy and finance background. Um, I ran think tanks uh, for a while and uh, about five years ago decided it was time to focus all my energy on an, an idea that I'm very, very excited about, uh, which is the gray rhino concept. I came up with the gray rhino shortly after Greece and its creditors came to an agreement in 2012 that prevented a chaotic default and collapse probably of the euro as well. I went back and thought about my time in Argentina 10 years earlier, where there'd been a proposal to do something similar. And Argentina didn't want to lose face because it was convinced it was still the, the darling of the emerging markets. And the bankers didn't want to do a restructuring because of all sorts of reasons, but one of the most of which was that uh, they stood to make a lot of money underwriting a, a new deal that just kicked the can down into the future. And so of course, Argentina had an opportunity to head off a crisis, a big scary thing that was coming at them and they didn't. And Greece actually sat down with the creditors and they solved the problem. So I really wanted to know what makes the difference in both cases, big, obvious, scary thing coming at them. The, the rhino came into my head because the, you know, the danger, the horn pointed at you, the big thing coming at you, it was just a perfect image to think about. And of course, in, many, in so many years in policy, I realized that you can do as many spreadsheets or analysis and, and, and you know, scenarios as you want, but unless you connect people emotionally, you're just wasting your time. And so my idea was that if you can really connect with this image of the, the gray rhino on, you know, on the road coming right at you and use that to connect with the obvious things around you that people are talking about, that there's news stories about, there's headlines, that there are already some people doing things about, but that people have a shockingly hard time dealing with. So Rhino because of the image, and it's gray because uh, I had to go back to my grade school days of going and visiting rhinos in the zoo. I didn't remember very much, but um, there's actually a species called the black rhino, which is not actually black. There's another species called the white rhino, which, as you probably guessed, is not actually white. Um, they're both actually gray, but we don't call them that. So it seemed to me to be a great way to reinforce this metaphor for these obvious things that we twist ourselves into pretzels to avoid seeing, to avoid confronting, to avoid managing. And it's not just dangers, it's also opportunities. It's this, this two ton weight of the rhino that you can either be destroyed by or you can hop on the back of and 
do something amazing with. It's amazing how effective an image and metaphor like this can be for helping people recognize and retain the message. It's also a great way to set the stage for the conversations that need to be taking place. So when, when did your book first come out? So I actually introduced the term in 2013 at the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum in Davos. Uh, the book came out in April of 2016 uh, during a kind of crazy news cycle when all anyone could get any time for was the presidential campaign. Um, but it really got big the following year when it came out in China, uh, where the, the financial team has, has used it to try to focus attention on some of these longer term financial fragilities, you know, corporate debt, uh, state owned enterprises, you know, debt was a really big part of the focus. Um, but uh, uh, China's leader, Xi Jinping, has embraced the concept. He's actually quoted it in public. He keeps the book on his bookshelf and displays it. And so in the summer of 2017, uh, the concept really took off. You know, global headlines. Uh, there was a front page headline in the People's Daily saying, you know, watch out not just for black swans, but for gray rhinos. And Chinese, the Chinese stocks, the, the riskiest ones at least, fell by about 5% in a single day because the gray rhino was on the front page of People's Daily. And so that really, uh, and it's kept building since then. And of course, this, um, this spring with the, the arrival of the coronavirus, it was just a perfect, perfect metaphor for warnings that went unheeded. Things that some people did see, did talk about, and look at where we are right now. We're still in the middle of a big mess, much of which could have been avoided. A question comes to mind regarding whether mind share around this has expanded significantly outside of China, or is there something different that makes this a harder topic to deal with in other cultures? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. At the, at the beginning, I got a surprising amount of pushback in the United States. And of course, you know, the concept came out of finance, so I sort of assumed that that's where a lot of the audience would be. But I found that people were so enamored of this black swan concept, you know, thing that's so unforeseeable and improbable that you can't even see it. Even though there's an, there's an armchair industry of people saying, that's a black swan, that's a black swan, uh, which by definition makes it not a black swan anymore. But, you know, but the, the real industry was people looking in hindsight at, you know, portfolio managers, policymakers, and other investors using the black swan as a way to justify not having made a decision to get out of the way of the problem. <laughs> Yeah. Excuses, a big, a big cop out. And uh, it's interesting, you, you look actually at the second quarter earnings from banks in the US this year, and trading revenue was way up in cases 70% or more. But you know, the commercial banking side, the, you know, the investment in the, in the real economy, that was a disaster, and, you know, doubled loan loss reserves, all sorts of things. And I finally realized that part of the pushback in the States was that People were making too much money off of people thinking just about black swans and not not gray rhinos. Um, but this spring, it's actually been amazing. Um, I sort of keep track of uh, uh, mentions, and uh, there have been about uh, 350 mentions of the gray rhino that I know of around the world uh, this year in 32 languages and in 25 countries. Um, I wrote a piece in the Washington Post in March that got a lot of attention coming back and coming out and, and pushing back against this idea that this was a black swan that nobody saw coming. Wall Street Journal picked that up. The Economist picked it up. I started getting invitations to, to write all over the world. Uh, a lot of people emailed me about the, the great TED talk that Bill Gates did about pandemics in 2015 and all the people who've been warning and warning about gray rhinos. And so COVID seemed to be really the, the moment when it, it struck a chord in the United States in a big way. Uh, Europe had already used the concept a lot in the risk management and disaster uh, risk reduction communities. Uh, other central banks around the world had used it, uh, policy communities everywhere from South Africa to Singapore. Uh, and I'm, I'm getting a lot of attention again in, uh, in Latin America. I'll be doing an interview on the radio in Panama this, uh, this weekend. And uh, I will be doing a talk in, uh, in Argentina. And uh, we just sold the translation rights in Brazil, which will be the, the sixth translated edition. So it seems to have just really um, become the metaphor of the moment this year. And I'm, I'm really glad because you look for the silver linings out of this, this 
terrible crisis. And one of the biggest things I think we could see would be a mindset shift for people to say, okay, we had our, we had our love affair with the black swan. That's great, but we need to fix the problems going ahead. We need to look at fixing the problems in the real economy and the, the people who've been making off of volatility, the people who've been making money off of volatility, well, that's all very nice for, for them, but let's pay some attention to the rest of us right now because ultimately the stock market is not going to be able to last at, at, crazy highs if the real economy doesn't hold it up. We, we saw that with, uh, with the, the Dutch tulip bulb, bulb craze. We saw it with the investment in the bonds of the imaginary kingdom of, of Poirier that nobody ever bothered to check to see if it was real or not. We've seen these cycles again and again. And really what I want people to do is to, to look at the things ahead of us that we know our problems, the, the things right now that are problems, and stop coming up with excuses not to deal with them. We really need a mindset shift. Are there specific criteria for what constitutes a gray rhino? I mean, are there red flags we can look for to help us recognize these things? Absolutely. Well, the essence of it is high impact, obvious, and probable. That's really the core of it. Uh, it's been interesting to see how people have added their own embellishments to it. Uh, they, they really go crazy with the metaphor, like the rhino and the grass and the safari and <laughs> things like that. And I usually encourage people to, to picture it, you know, that the rhino on the road right ahead of you, it's got its horn pointed your way, it's pawing the ground, it's snorting, it's angry, it's getting ready to, grow, to go. But the truth is the rhino can be on the hill next to you or you're not so worried about it right now there are different kinds of rhinos there are some that are that are farther away there are some that are faster moving there are some that are slower moving there are some that stand on their own there are some that that are closely related to others uh interestingly the zoologically correct term for a group of gray rhinos is a crash uh, which uh, <laughs> you know poetic, poetic license can't do that any better right. um, but it's really it, it's the heart of it really is this obvious high impact and that maybe not everyone's talking about it, but somebody is. If you can see it in front of you, if you're looking through the windshield and it's there, it's a gray rhino. If you can only see it in the rear view mirror, it's a black swan, at which point it's not that useful to you anymore. Yeah, right. Are there specific weaknesses in us as a species that make it harder for us to recognize and deal with gray rhinos, or am I just looking for an excuse? No, no, I don't think you are, all, are at all. You know, one of my points is that it, it is very human to fail to deal with these things. Uh, I found that in the United States, more than in Europe or China, people get very defensive. They're like, well, if it's obvious, well, I'm dealing with it. And, well, what do you mean I'm not dealing with obvious things? They get very defensive. And my point is not like, no, it's, it's okay. There's, there's no shame in that. You're human. And one of the ongoing themes I, I've spent a lot of time with is this, this um, two sides of one coin thing, the, the, the strength and the weakness. And so you say, hey, this is it's a human weakness uh, that we don't always pay enough attention to what's in front of us. Well, that actually was evolved as a defense mechanism, as in some ways a strength. Um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross talks a lot a lot about this in, the, in her work on the, the five stages of, of grief. Um, in that denial, which is you know, the first stage of when, when a gray rhino is facing you, denial is actually a defense mechanism. It's to help you to cope with things because sometimes things are so big and overwhelming and emotionally shocking that if you absorb the whole thing at once, you might just implode. I mean, you, you think about you know, when you have a, a, a death of a friend and family, that time in the beginning when it's very, very numb, like you don't always feel it at first. And that's on purpose. That's a strength to help us to be able to deal with things when we're ready. And so a certain amount of deniable, it, a certain amount of denial is understandable and human, and you need to forgive yourself for it. But you need to recognize that it happens. And if you let it go on for too long, that's when you get into trouble. All of these little biases, little you know, quirks of the human mind uh, get in our way. We, we have an optimism bias. We, we are more likely to hold on to information that that's, comes through rose-colored rose glasses, the things that we want 
to hear. Uh, if we hear about a problem and the solution is something that's really unpleasant, there's something called solution aversion, that we'll, we'll try to avoid thinking about the problem because we don't like the solution. Um, there's, uh, there's a very interesting dynamic in, in groups, which you know, they actually call groupthink or confirmation bias, um, closely related concepts, which is that if you have a people, if you have a group of people sitting around a table and they all come from the same perspective, whether it's the same demographic or gender or profession or schools they went to, anything like that, they're much more likely to just nod their head when somebody else says something. So you'll see in a lot of boardrooms, lots of people who went to the same schools, who come from the same perspective, the same generation, same gender, the first person says something, everybody just goes around the room and nods, 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 nods. Uh, that's the group thing in action. You know, we're, we're much less likely to pay attention to red flags and warning signals and alternative points of view when we're in a group. And that effect is stronger and stronger the more homogeneous the group is. So these are, these are human things. I mean, they're, they're part of all of us. But the good news is that when you're aware of them, you can come up with tools and strategies and processes to try to counteract those, to make better decisions, to not only make sure that you're paying attention to the gray rhino in front of you, but that you're looking at what you're doing in response, that you're evaluating your response and whether it's working or not, whether you need to adjust that, uh, whether you can pat yourself on the back, or whether you need to keep coming back to the same thing. Because so many of these gray rhinos are, are what I call recurring rhinos, you know, financial crises, or, you know, you see, you know, weather issues. Uh, there, there are these cycles of things that we see again and again, or the pandemic, say. My great-grandfather died in the second wave of the, uh, the great flu epidemic of 1918 in November. So, uh, you know, pandemics happen all the time in different guises. And another bias that we have is that we look at what happened the last time. And if like the last time there was a pandemic, oh, it was in the other corner of the world, oh, it didn't really affect us, nobody I know died, then we're much less likely to pay attention to the next one. And we've been surprisingly lucky with the, the last you know, 20, 30 years or so that most of those didn't affect us. And for the countries that experienced, you know, SARS or MERS or Ebola, they were much more alert. In particular, you look at, at, you know, at, at Hong Kong with SARS, you look at the Asian countries that really snapped up to respond to the coronavirus. It's because they had a much more emotionally salient memory. Whereas you know, in the West, we're like, oh, that's, that's not gonna happen to us. And that got us into a lot of trouble. So being aware of those biases lets you compensate for them and change your behavior so that you're not making the same mistakes in the future. A couple of your points really stood out to me as being especially important for members of the fair community. For example, solution aversion sounds a lot like some of the arguments against better risk management um, or risk measurement. People resist the idea of changing the way they think about and deal with risks. So they, so they argue that current approaches work just fine. And, and the change isn't needed. It definitely is. I wish I could remember who uh, who said this, but there, somebody came out and said that there's two kinds of companies. There's the ones that have been hacked and the, the ones that haven't been hacked. Uh, you know, we it is recurring in a lot of ways. We we hear every so often about you know another big credit card company, another big company with all sorts of of the records of users gets hacked, that information gets stolen, somebody else uh, gets ransomware that they've got to deal with. I mean, you know, it's, it's an ongoing thing. It becomes more and more difficult to deal with because the hackers get more and more sophisticated. And similarly, while people learn more about, you know, phishing and don't open this email and don't click on that link, you know, the smarter people get, the more schemes the, the cyber criminals come up with. And it's also becoming more and more dangerous because more and more things are connected. You have the whole internet, uh, internet of things phenomenon now. You've got uh, the, these, these very vulnerable power grids, information grids, all sorts of things. Uh, so it really raises the need for, you know, for redundancy, for constant reminders of 
the problem and it, you get you get a challenge there similar to you know fire drills at, at companies like you're like oh it's the first tuesday of the month do i really have to go out in the hall again <laughs> you know, so at some point you know the warnings that you get stop stop resonating as much but it's it's very much it's a clear and present danger uh, you know boards are paying much more attention to it uh, i've seen some surveys about board members feeling it's a big problem not feeling they're prepared not feeling like they even know what to do and that's dangerous because when you feel helpless or powerless when you feel you don't have enough information when you feel you don't have a sense of agency that can protect yourself against a problem. Most people are likely to succumb to these little gremlins in our heads and just push it away. The, you know, the, the real answer is get the knowledge that you need. Find the person who's got the knowledge. Uh, make a habit of checking in and saying, hey, am I doing this? Um, so there's, it's a big, uh, it's a big, big, big problem. So I'm very, very glad that you, you brought that up. This is great. Here again, there seems to be a solid hook into risk analysis measurement and communication space. Specifically, you know, many boards and executives express frustration regarding the vague and difficult to interpret security metrics and, and heat maps. And, and my own experience is that this can translate into numbness to the message we're trying to communicate. In fact, that was the primary catalyst for, for developing FAIR in the first place to get past that, to enable them to to understand this message more clearly and take it more ser seriously. The second point was that, you know, this also ties directly back into your point about agency. When the efficacy of the options we're presenting executives is vague, and especially when instead of options or, or a clear understanding of efficacy, they're told that the organization has to do something in particular, some particular mitigation because it's required or because it's considered best practice, you know, there's clearly going to be a lack of agency in, in that situation. So a question comes to mind though, do, do gray rhinos become something else once they're being addressed? Absolutely. Um, to just go back to your first question about, you know, does it change? Part of the definition of the, the gray rhino is, is actually that people may be do some, doing something or they may not. You know, unlike, you know, the black swan where it's, it's unforeseeable. So obviously nobody's doing anything about it because you can't do anything about something you can't see. Or the elephant in the room, which by definition, nobody's seeing, nobody's doing, and no, nobody's doing anything about it, even though it's, it's standing right there. It, the, the whole metaphor normalizes the idea of doing nothing. And I created the gray rhino to have some, some ambiguity there, to, that there is a choice. Um, you know, there are some people who are seeing it. There are some people who are out there, you know, lighting themselves on fire to get other people to, to pay attention to it. And, you know, there, there are other people who say, oh, well, I'll, I'll just let it trample the guy behind me. Um, so there really is that, that choice and that, that dynamism. So it's, it's still a gray rhino, whether you're doing something about it or not. And the point of the metaphor is really get people to recognize that they're, that they're not, they're more likely to not be doing something than they think of. To, and to say, it's okay to recognize that, but now go and do something about it. Um, I think a lot about climate change, you know, in terms of agency and what we're doing or not. Uh, I got a lot of calls from reporters over the spring. And this was before it became obvious um, how poorly we were dealing with the coronavirus. But they were asking, you know, why are we freaking out about the coronavirus and dealing with it? and not climate change. And the conventional wisdom explanation is that, well, oh, well, climate change is something down the road. This is like not happening yet. And I look at, you know, the wildfires on the West Coast this year. It's, I'm talking to my friends out there, I'm absolutely, you know, terrified for them. I mean, here's, I have a friend in Seattle who used to write the return address on, on letters as, uh, it always rains here instead of Seattle. And I look at like they've had so little rain that it's, it's you know, it's a disaster. You look at Australia, uh, you know, here in Chicago, we've got the opposite problem with water. You know, my building had to install a sump pump after a terrible storm that we had uh, last year. Uh, Lake Michigan is, is, depending on when you measure it, but about 40 
feet above normal. And last time I checked about six feet above the previous record, you know, my, my dog is upset because she can't go to her dog beach because it's under 15 feet of water at this point. So it drives me nuts when people say, oh, well, climate change is down the road. I'm like, it's, it's here. And part of the discussion about that is that oh, people say, oh, it's, it's too big. What can any one single person do? And the question is not whether one single person can do anything or not. It's whether lots of one single person units can do this. A project drawdown has a fantastic list of all the things that people can do about climate change, whether it's like a policy decision or whether it's, you know, switching to electric vehicle or public transportation or, you know, reducing food waste or you know, all sorts of things. And uh, there was a study that came out uh, fairly recently about the ones that were behavioral, the, the, the things that you can do to change you know, your, your daily life. And a lot of them are very, very simple, like the, you know, taking shorter showers, things like that. And that study showed that depending on how many people adopted these behavior changes, that could reduce between about 20% and I think 37% of emissions. That's pretty darn significant. Um, so I think a lot of times we, we think that we don't have power over something and it's like not enough to do a little tiny thing. And I think we need to change that mentality quite a bit because there's, there's a lot that people can do. And the, the, the flip side of that argument too is that people say, well, uh, there's this big conspiracy that you know, if you get people to think it's their individual responsibility, then they'll, they'll let the corporations off the hook and they'll let the governments off the hook. And it's true that you know, some big polluting corporations have actually sponsored some of these campaigns to, to promote individual action. But in all my work in policy over the years, I've seen that the way to get people to do big things is to start them out with the little things. So someone who is paying attention to what they consume uh, are going to be more likely to put pressure on a corporation to you know, offer the right products. They're going to be more likely to speak out to their elected officials and say, hey, I want you to be doing something about it. So these little things can actually lead to bigger things. And I get very upset when I see these, these articles, most of them probably by like a kid out of college who's doing his, his first assignment and his editor told him, go do something counterintuitive. Say, you know, if you're switching from meat to vegetarian, you're a sucker. You know, they cannot do these articles, which are, are so, I mean, maybe well-meaning, but I think wrongheaded and, and counterproductive. And it goes back to, as you said, this, this sense of agency. What can I do to make a difference? And then the leap that you need to make once you start doing things is, okay, what's the impact of what I'm doing? Is it working? Is it having the effect that I want? And do I need to adjust that? Michelle, you make a crucial point right there. Is, is what we're doing having the desired effect? I mean, I look at how our industry tends to operate, a heavy reliance on checklists and intuition, and at the same time, I see loss events occur regularly. So at what point do we as a profession begin to ask ourselves whether what we're doing is really effective? I look at one breach after another, and it seems to me pretty clear that poor communication and, and poor prioritization are a big part of these events happening. Absolutely. You mentioned communication, which, which is so important. I've been doing a lot of thinking about what we can learn from communications about, you know, about masks, about social distancing, uh, about shelter in place, all of the, the COVID things that, uh, that can help. And I talked to a lot of people who specialize in this, and uh, there were a couple of key points. I wrote about this uh, recently for my strategy and business column, um, but one of them is that you've got to hit the right balance between freak out fear and complacency. Like you gotta get someone scared enough to do something, but not so scared that they go into denial mode and just you know, refuse to, to deal with things. The second big point is that you need to get people to understand that here's something you can do every day, super easy, and it works. So you've probably seen some of those uh, infographics going up around about masks 
And, you know, if you're both wearing a mask, there's a 1% risk of infection. If one person is wearing it, it's this, if the, you know, the other person's wearing it. And there's, there's one I haven't seen, but uh, someone told me about that. If you're both in your own house, <laughs> there's no chance that you're going to get it. Um, but it's, it's true that you, you need to communicate. This works and you can use a combination of emotion and numbers that so, you know the percents in those infographics and then uh, and there's this great video by this guy um uh dr rob who takes these uh styrofoam mannequin heads and uh um an aerosol sprayer and uh, a lighter at different distances with masks and without masks and he shows how much more likely your styrofoam head is to explode in flames if you're wearing a mask or not. It's absolutely brilliant. And you know, there's no percentages, there's no data, there's none of that. It's just this pure emotion. In fact, one of the things he does, he, he opens a beer can and he fills up his mouth and he, he sprays out the, the, the beer to illustrate the, the spreading of the droplets. And those sort of, of messages, the sort of communications tools, I think are very applicable to just about any kind of risk that you're talking about it. You know, I agree completely that it very often requires an emotional connection before people will will act. But unfortunately, in my experience, the, the or from my perspective, at any rate, the risk management profession and, and especially the cybersecurity profession has taken this too far too often. And you know, you're familiar with the FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and and I just have seen too many people rely on that to scare executives into doing something. And, and besides, frankly, being a little bit, in my view, dishonest, because you're really not informing, you're just scary. And, and, and you, your own biases tend to play a significant role in that then. But there's also a shelf life to fear. And, and that plays out when you, you pedal fear and certainty and doubt over and over again and you know the bad thing doesn't happen and eventually they become numb to it and and, and view you as chicken little so you know i agree there, there's absolutely a balance to be struck here it's it's very true and i think if you communicate also that here's the progress that we've made that's a very very good message and the thing is that even with things you think you solved it's worth circling back from time to time. I mean, I've, I've had a number of uh, autoimmune disorders for, for many, many, many years. And, you know, when, in, the, in the early on in my career, when I just sort of first dealt with it, and then I'm like, okay, I made these changes, I fixed it. And then of course, wasn't paying attention five years later when the symptoms started creeping up. And, and so, so now it's sort of an ongoing process. And uh, I, I'd like to ask myself regularly, actually, you know, what's the gray rhino? What's the thing that you need to be dealing with right now that you know about and what are you doing about it? All sorts of great little tools like that. There's a, a marketing firm that I write about in the Gray Rhino called 100 Years. And uh, one of the Christmas gifts they sent out one year was a little uh, uh, hourglass say, saying, spend 15 minutes thinking about 100 years from now. You know, think about the long term. And you put that in your, in your calendar. Uh, you, you, you have friends who, you know, when you talk with them, bump heads about it. You know, what's the gray rhino? You know, in the, however often you do the, the board meeting or whatever team meeting. So you ask yourself those questions regularly and it's, it's worth looking at the list of them. Having, I like to have like the top ones, you know, the personal one, the business one, the community and the world one so you don't want to have too many but you don't have your priority but you just review quickly the other ones you know if they're going up or down on the list and i know there's a lot of controversy in the uh in the risk management community about some of these lists the, you know the heat maps the you know which which risks are becoming more or less uh salient and i think it's important to understand their limitations uh, but i also think it's important to look at what they are useful for. And I think that keeping a regular tab on the possible risks out there, that the possible impact, the possible probability is important. And I think it's also very important to look at the flip side that I don't think gets enough attention in the risk management world is our responses to those. So every year I do a, a, a review of, of, at this point, it's I think close to, to five dozen 
uh, annual top risks, forecasts, outlooks, you know, they're, they're called different things. They're slightly different in different industries. It's sort of, you know, apples, oranges, figs, and bananas, but try to go through there and with a combination of art and science, figure, figure out really what's keeping people up at night. And then look at the flip side saying, okay, what are we doing about these things? Are we getting better or are we getting worse? And tie that also into what is it about each one of us, you know, our innate personality, our environment, you know, the, the corporate culture that we set up, uh, the policy environment. What about that whole risk ecosystem makes us more or less likely to deal with the gray rhinos that we have identified. And, and that's a whole area where uh, I've actually been, been writing about that in my next book and in the interviews where I ask people about it, they're like, I never thought about that. And oh, wow, you just blew my mind. Uh, so I'll be very interested that you maybe have this conversation uh, next year you know, about what people are, are doing when they take a really hard look at themselves and you know, what they're doing, what their organization is doing, what their elected officials are doing to deal not just with the immediate risks in, in a company and, you know, day-to-day -day operations or even, you know, medium to long-term strategy, but some of these bigger issues, you know, you know climate change, uh, you know, inequality, uh, financial fragility, those things that are going to affect your business and that you don't need to assume that you can't possibly do anything about them. And, and think about what it is that you can do. It's so important. Let's dig into that a bit. What, what, what kinds of things can individuals and businesses and communities, government agencies do to manage the, the population of gray rhinos that they face? Sure. Uh, and, and I'm so glad you talked about managing the population instead of like, you know, killing or hunting. I see that in headlines. So I'm like, no, 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 they're endangered. You can't kill the rhinos. So I like to talk about, you know, wrangling or handling or, or taming uh, your rhinos. Uh, there are two analyses that I go through. Um, in, and you know, I've, I've done workshops with trade associations and companies on these, which uh, first is going through a sort of a five stage analysis of where you are with your gray rhino. And uh, the first one, as, as I hinted before, is you know, denial. Mm -hmm. Hats off to Elizabeth Kubler Ross, um, which is what it sounds like. Uh, the second one is muddling. You're, like, you're not denying anymore, but you have a thousand reasons why you're not going to deal with the problem. It's, it, you're, you're focused on the obstacles and the inertia. You do a mindset shift to get to the third stage, which is diagnosing, which is what does it take? to solve the problems. And that involves a, a drill down into the kinds of gray rhinos. You know, how close is it? How fast is it coming? Uh, can I solve this if I don't solve this other one at the same time? Um, really looking, you know, is there political will? What do I need? Who can help me? What are the resources do I, do I need and how do I get them? The fourth stage is panic, or I, I try to get people to reframe it as urgency. But uh, when I talk about this, I'll often use the, the, the Edvard Munch scream um, uh, painting, you know, with the guy going, ah! Uh, but that's the time, it's very interesting. It's when everybody is running around saying, do something, do something, anyone, just do something. It's the time when you're most likely to do something. You're also more sli most likely to do the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then some people are most likely to freeze and get completely paralyzed and trampled and it's it's all over and that's the stage where it's very useful to have gone through the diagnosing stage and to have a real plan that you can shove under people's noses of course that doesn't always work i mean you know we had a uh, you had a group like that in the trump administration last year who did something around a pandemic like this one and they, they had the plan you had all sorts of plans that just never got looked at so you got to get people to you know, to look at your plan, uh, but you also want to create a sense of urgency much farther ahead of time so that you don't get in this panic stage or hopefully you can leapfrog it altogether and go to action, which is the final stage, which is when, yes, people are doing something. It often starts with a critical mass um, of people who decided that this needs to move and they try to get other people to do that. Uh, these the sort of mavericks, the, the, the the influencers, the people who are ahead of the curve saying, hey, this is a problem. And 
what you want to do there is aggregate as many people as you can around to amplify and support the work of these leaders. Uh, and then you want to track what you're doing to see if it works or not. And then the other tool that I use is overlaying uh, against this, uh, this five stage process is a, a, stake, a shareholder analysis, a stakeholder analysis. You know, who are the people who are either affected by this or who can change the outcome of it? Where are they in these five stages? And what do you need to do to move them closer to the action stage? So there's a real strong analytical framework behind it. Now, it's, it's unlike the black swan where you say, oh, that was a black swan, and you move on, and you wash your hands, and you get you know, absolved of it. But you know, there's really not a lot of there there. But you know, great rhino thinking really is about a mindset shift, a strategic analysis of where you're at, and what you need to get farther forward, and then where all the key stakeholders in your ecosystem are, and what you need to do to get them forward. And communications, obviously, is a very big part of that. The stages you describe sound all too familiar to me. I'd, I'd love to spend another hour just exploring those alone. But this is, however, a great place to wrap up the session. You know, Michelle, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you today. And I'm certain that those listening found it to be very enlightening. So thank you so very much for joining us. Thank you. I'm, I'm such a big fan of the work you guys are doing and just, you know, love the thoughtful conversations with you. So hopefully your, uh, your audience will have found at least something useful from this conversation. So thank you for, for making a part of it.